Greetings, fellow investigators, and welcome to our video podcast, Into the Darkness, where my friends and I play the Call of Cthulhu role-playing game. I'm your host, Tom Rayleigh. We are about to begin a campaign set in the early 90s. It's entitled At Your Door. It's considered to be a classic campaign composed of six scenarios that blend together. It was written by Ellen Eisenwill, Mark Morrison, Barbara Manui, Chris Adams, Scott D. Anielowski, and Herbert Hike. Last time I looked, it was available on Amazon.com. So let's uh, introduce our players. Uh, Keith, why don't you tell us about your character? Thanks, Tom. I will be playing uh, Dr. Heather Mills. She is a uh, professor of biology out of UC Berkeley. She uh, became interested in biology and uh, saving the planet after she tragically lost her father, to, uh, who uh, got sick after living in the Love Canal during the Love Canal disaster of the 1970s. Morgan? I'm playing Dr. Margaret Evans, who... Um, is a professor of parasitology at the University of Utah, um, who uh, all her life she's cared deeply about the environment and in fact went as far as to chain herself to a fence of a factory to stop the production of Agent Orange during the Vietnam War. Excellent. Brian? I'm playing Dr. Jonathan Liege, a 37-year-old microbiologist who works at Dartmouth College. All right, David. I'll be playing Desmond Torres, uh, whose undergraduate experimentation with mushrooms led to a career in mycology, um, uh, also a committed environmentalist and a member of Full Wilderness. Cool. And Jason. Hi, I'll be playing uh, Dr. Ethan Carlisle. He grew up with his father, uh, was a member of Greenpeace, so he traveled around the world, uh, and he grew an affinity for animals. He became a zookeeper, a veterinarian, and he's also a member of Full Wilderness, and he just basically wants to protect the planet and the animals. But, you know, things that can't protect themselves, he wants to help. Excellent. All right. So, without any further delay, let's begin our journey into the darkness. <clears throat> it was wonderful flying first class for a change. You could stretch out your legs and relax in comfort. You've enjoyed the privilege a few times before, but it was a first for your assistant, and the excitement was palpable. The flight attendant had just brought you your favorite beverage, and you looked out your window at the changing scenery far below. It was just the day before yesterday that your agent forwarded you an intriguing email, and here you were flying to California in style. The email was from the world-renowned Robert Jadick, CEO of the most prominent environmentalist group in the world, Full Wilderness Corporation. The email had read, Dear Friend of the Earth, Your name was recommended to me through your agency. We at Full Wilderness have encountered an unusual and sensitive situation, one which we believe requires your particular set of skills. A team is being formed and we would like you to be included. It is essential and urgent that we meet face to face. Airfare, airfare and accommodations will be provided. I'm prepared to offer your usual retainer plus $10,000 premium for your expertise and discretion. Please convey any concerns or requirements you may have to my secretary, Clarice Noveski. I look forward to meeting you at your earliest possible convenience. Sincerely, Robert Jadick, Council Head. After landing in San Francisco, you and your assistant took a short charter flight south 180 miles to your destination, San Damiel. The journey was less comfortable, but short, only about 40 minutes. You arrived about 9.15 in the morning on Wednesday, August 1st, 1991. At Eastwood Airport, you were met by a chauffeur holding a neat little sign bearing your name. San Damiel was a bright seaside city. Like San Francisco to the north and Los Angeles to the south, it had grown dramatically thanks to its sunny beaches and its dramatic backdrop. Southward from the city, the cliffs rose up majestically, and the ocean relentlessly crashed against them. Beyond that, the lush vegetation gave way to low agricultural land, 
almost all the way down to Los Angeles. Your ecological knowledge reminded you that without irrigation, it would all revert to desert in no time. To the north and inland to the east, the land rose up into the Los Padre Mountains, covered in a mantle of evergreen. There were even giant redwoods just a few miles up the coast. Most of the time, the weather was mild. A number of major corporations had taken up residence, and their skyscrapers rose up in the center of the city and gleamed like quartz crystals. The limo pulled up to the entrance of the Crocker Hotel, where you would be staying. It just so happened that on that day, the pavement was crowded with colorful street performers and vendors selling their wares. You could hear music and the din of the crowd from inside your limo. People milled about laughing and shopping and being entertained in the large plaza where a few palm trees provided the only shade and the smell of food permeated the air. The chauffeur came around and opened the door and you were immediately struck by the heat of late summer. The temperature was in the high 80s and the humidity was up. You were glad to arrive in the air-conditioned lobby. The atrium was bright and shiny with polished marble, glass, and chrome rising up seven stories on the inside with a further 25 floors above that. Sparkling fountains with mirrored sculptures danced while well-dressed people lounged about laughing, chatting, and sipping cool drinks. There was a restaurant, Pickman's Bistro, and a cafe, Coffee Lou's, at one end, which looked inviting. After you checked in, the bellman took your luggage. You stood quietly in front of the elevator, but before it arrived, you suddenly felt a slight queasiness and a change in your sense of balance. A low rumbling began to echo around the open space, and you could feel the ground sway slightly beneath your feet. Conversations all around you ceased, and you observed in the faces of the people around you just a hint of that fight-or-flight look in their eyes. A moment later, and the sensation passed. Everyone laughed reassuringly and continued whatever they were doing. The bellman smiled and quipped, Your first earthquake? (laughs) Welcome to California. Your suite on the 17th floor was enormous. At least it seemed so compared to to most hotel rooms you'd stayed in before. Two bedrooms, one for you and one for your assistant, separate bathrooms, a desk, and a sitting area where you could meet with your team, and ample closet space. Oh, and there was a safe. A large part of one wall was glass from floor to ceiling, and it looked out on the spectacular Bridgestone building across the plaza, whose gleaming cylinder was surrounded by flower gardens and colorful crepe myrtle trees. You knew that Full Wilderness Corporation occupied the 13th and 14th floor of that building. 20 minutes after your arrival, the phone rang. Miss Clarice Noveski explained to you that you would be meeting Mr. Chadick at 1 p.m. It was 10.30 now. She also explained that the other members of your team were in the rooms next to yours and that you should feel free to get acquainted. She suggested the Scat Cat Lounge on the 32nd floor of the Crocker. You gave the chore of unpacking to your assistant, and you headed up to the lounge. This was going to be an interesting case. Well, I will uh, head on up there, and uh, since I'm meeting uh, with my uh, financer, I will order a tea instead of an adult beverage. I don't want to show up tipsy. And uh, I will look around and see if I see anyone that I would recognize as, you know, a fellow person brought out here. The Scat Cat Lounge is a very nice little uh, uh, bar and lounge. Uh, It's all done in the 1920s, sort of Art Deco style. The the staff all seem to be male. They're all dressed in uh, period suits with little vests. Um, There's soft jazz playing. Uh, saxophone playing, and uh, it's very comfortable. And you all see each other. Uh, Some of you have already met one another, and you're all sort of congregating at a table. Yeah. So, so uh, anyone have any ideas why why Mr. JTIC uh, would have summoned us out here? I mean, it's quite the eclectic uh, collection of specialties. 
Well, I was hoping somebody else knew the answer to that. Oh, uh, well, well, you know, from what I understand, sometimes he has, he likes to have a little flair and maybe show, keep us all on edge of our seat. The letter yeah. did seem uh, dramatic. Yeah, the request specifically for discretion always catches one's eye. I don't imagine that this is patentable research that we're doing here or wherever we're going. Yeah, but fortunately it's uh, me and in August, I'm on uh, still a little bit left on my summer break before I have to get back to work. It allowed me to bring one of my grad students with me. Oh yes, I brought one of mine too. Oh, good. Yes, same, same here. Excellent opportunity for them. You got some field experience. If we're going into a field, I'm hoping that we're going into a full wilderness preserve. I mean, generally people aren't allowed in. Uh, and I would love to experience uh, some deeply protected land that isn't also radioactive from Chernobyl. Oh, I, I understand that. I would love to get in there too. And that way I could uh, maybe finish writing my, uh, my latest uh, article for uh, how the earth is able to uh, take care of itself and doesn't need man manipulating it constantly. So I guess, is there anything that you want to do between now and one o'clock? I guess we're just going to, I mean, you know, we want to satisfy our curiosity, but nobody knows anything more than that introductory letter. Correct. We're going somewhere discreetly and all of our uh, specialties. Do we know if this is the, of the whole group, the whole team, as he called it? Yes. Just us. I'm, I'm guessing we just spend, at least for me, we spend the rest of the time discussing what our specialties are, getting to know each other on a more personal level and, you know, discussing maybe some papers or some theories just to get a familiarity with each other. All right. We'll say that, uh, well, let's sort of say this sort of happens. Um, you guys meet each other. You guys talk, as you say, for a while. Uh, ultimately, you're going to want to, you know, after an hour or so, you're going to want to go back down, uh, freshen up, You've been on the airplane all this time. Get ready. Um, uh, do you want to set your uh, assistants to do anything in particular? Or maybe they want to go down and mill around the, uh, the farmer's market or whatever is going on downstairs while you go into uh, full wilderness. Uh, but we'll say it's about 15 minutes to one. Okay. Well, then... Uh... I would definitely, at 15 minutes to one, I'll definitely start headed to uh, the 13th or 14th floor, whichever one the reception's in. The recep well, well, we'll assume that you are all going to meet in the lobby. You're in the Crocker Hotel. Uh, Full Wilderness is in the Bridgestone Building, which is across the, uh, the plaza. Right. Um, there's no street in between. Okay. Um, and uh, so you arrive in the lobby, and you get in the elevator, and you head up. Mm -hmm. uh, a few seconds later, you arrive on the 13th floor, and uh, as you step out, you step out into a large uh, atrium area uh, that goes up two stories high. It's their reception area, uh, and you can see there's balconies up above. You can see that there's lots of people milling about. Uh, uh, people seem dressed in... Uh, you know, uh, linen and, uh, and natural fibers. Uh, a few people have leather jackets and boots. You don't see any fur whatsoever. Uh, you see uh, a lot of gold jewelry, a lot of turquoise jewelry on people. Um, and in the center, uh, just behind where, like, the reception desk is, you can see a large circular area, the center of the building, and it looks like there's a campfire in the middle of the floor and uh, uh, sort of like rocks and what look like stumps sitting around it, um, like, a, like an Indian campfire. Everything is sort of got a, uh, 
an outdoorsman sort of look to it. There are large uh, uh, picture landscapes on the walls of beautiful, beautiful landscapes. Uh, do a spot hidden for me. Nope. I passed just one shy of a hard success. Okay. Well, one thing that you... Those of you who pass, the one thing that you notice is that there is no, not a hint of anything man-made or human in any of the pictures. They're pristine landscapes. Uh, you also begin to realize that you've read about some of these. This one is definitely in Norway, a place that they recovered uh, a large portion of land and had it set aside. And here's one in the rainforests in uh, South America, a very similar. Um, you tell the receptionist who you are, and a few moments later, a man comes, uh, definitely not Jadik. Um, he's, uh, looks like he's in his mid thirties. He's a little pudgy, but he's very well dressed, uh, has very nice shoes, very nice pants. And he comes up and he says, uh, he says, gentlemen, I'm, I'm glad to meet you. My name is, uh, Richard Slakes and, uh, uh, Mr. Jadik asked me if I would show you around, give you a little tour, let you see what this place looks like uh, before your meeting. So, uh, lead on. He shakes your hands and says, "It's good. Did you, did you have a nice? Did you have a nice flight? Uh, not too bumpy." No, the flight was wonderful. Excellent. Uh, and your hotel accommodations. Everything seems nice over there. Oh, they're fabulous! Fabulous. Thank you. Excellent, excellent. Well, let's see. Let's start. Uh, let's talk about this for a second. Uh, you can see the, the the reception area goes all the way up to the top. Well, it goes uh, two stories. You know. we, we occupy both stories. Uh, on the, the left side here on this level, we've got all the executive suites and the, and the conference rooms. And on the right-hand side, uh, you know, you've got the, the, the secretary pool and you've got the uh, um, uh, various uh, uh, computer data uh, resources and, and where they're working on uh, uh, soliciting uh, funding, you know, from, from various organizations and from people, you know, the, what we need, because this, this place is basically a nonprofit, uh, despite what you might be, it looks like. Uh, and then up there on the second floor, on the right-hand side, you've got, uh, that's where we're doing the magazine, uh, that's where it's produced. There's photo labs and, and all sorts of things like that and, 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 our, uh, and our staff. And then on this side, we do other sorts of things like that. We've got the, the, the calendar and the, uh, uh, the books that we've produced and, and so forth. And, and uh, you can see, if you look around, everybody's really happy. It's a nice place to work. Uh, people have been somewhat critical sometimes because, you know, they say there's a lot of money going along around here, but I think that's one of the things that makes working here such a nice thing. We're actually paid for the work we do. And we were successful because everybody, you know, you don't see any slouches or anything like that walking around. Everybody's doing their job. So if you have any questions, I'd be like, I'd be happy to answer them. And then we can go see Mr. Jadik. Thank you. Uh, yeah. Speaking of doing their jobs, uh, do you guys, have any estimation about how long we're going to be in the field with this project? Oh, I don't really know. I think they're going to pay you on a monthly basis until, until a pro rata, until the, until they're done with you or whatever. Oh, I forgot to mention the minute, the minute, the beginning, the middle, the middle of the building here. Since you see, this is uh, Robert can kind of considers us all to be council members mm. and uh, he runs this like a, a tribe and, uh, and this is our camp space, our campfire. And we sometimes come down here and we sit around the campfire and we discuss some of the things that we're doing with the company. And uh, it's, it's nice, you know, it, 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 sort of, it sort of builds a kind of camaraderie. Everybody feels like they're contributing to the, the whole thing. And now do all employees join into this council? Do heads of departments join? Well, I'm, for instance, a council head. Uh, I'm not a council head. I'm a council member. Uh, no, there's about, there's about 14 of us that are in charge of various departments. Um, 
But we also run our departments in a very similar way. These are all, everybody here is a member of the tribe. Um, but the Mr. Jacek, Jacek holds the, the position of council head. He's the, the president, of the, the CEO, yeah. Of course, of course. What department are you in charge of, Mr. Slicks? Uh I'm in charge of uh, human relations. Internal, external, both? Uh, internal, mostly. But, you know, we, we all sort of do what we need to do, uh, depending on what needs to be done. And uh, I've been a council head for about three years. I'm a council member for about three years now. How long have you been with the company? Total. Oh, well, I've been, I've been a member of Full Wilderness for, for quite a few years, since almost since the beginning. Uh, and uh, I've been involved mostly in various you know, marketing things and, and so forth and, and fundraising. But uh, right now, it's just mostly I'm in charge of uh, making sure everything runs smoothly here. So let's go see Mr. Jadik. I'm sure he's ready for you. Uh, let me take you in here. Uh, and uh, if you have any other questions, please feel free. If you can find me, uh, go ahead and uh, and uh, fire look me up. I'm here all the time. So, anyways, he takes you in uh, uh, up to a couple of double doors, and uh, he knocks and hears come in. Uh, he opens the door, and you go into uh, a room that is very outdoorsman, very woodsy. Um, uh, there's be you know, beautiful uh, uh, natural fiber carpets. Um, there's a beautiful desk. There's a couple of beautiful sculptures of, of whales and porpoises and bear and things like that made out of, looks like wood. And uh, standing up behind the desk is the man you recognize uh, Robert Jadick. He's about 60 years old. Uh, he's got gray hair. He's got a beard. Uh, it's nicely trimmed. Uh, he's got blue eyes. Uh, his skin is very tan from being out in the sun. He's wrinkly, you know, that, that kind of, but he looks like a big, healthy, strong guy. Uh, he's dressed in uh, red uh, plaid flannel, uh, but his pants, it's obvious he's got a nice Nice taste in clothes. His his slacks are uh, look expensive. Looks like he's wearing Italian shoes. Uh, and he comes out and he's like, "Oh, gentlemen, I'm so glad. I'm so glad that you've come. I uh, I've been longing to meet you all. I know that some of you are members, and uh, and that's very exciting. I'm glad for that. And hopefully, we'll have you all as members pretty quickly. Uh, please come in. Come in. Uh, or, uh, did Richard showed you around? It did. Uh, it's quite impressive out there, huh? It's amazing. I, uh, just uh, just the view of the uh, atrium, and then you know that you have a able to have a campfire in here where you're able to get together and build uh, team relations. It's it's just wonderful. It's very important. You know that's it's very important the way we the way we treat one another and the way we we work together because. Uh, God knows the environment. We've been screwing it up for too long, and we really need to, to work on fixing it. So, gentlemen, please uh, sit down. Um, and we'll get down to it. I'm, I'm, I trust, you know, your flight was good and your accommodations. If you have any trouble at all, anything that you need, you can contact me. Well, you can contact uh, Richard. You can talk, talk, contact my, my secretary, uh, Clarice Noveski. Uh, she's that uh, rather striking woman that's out of the desk outside. Um, Full Wilderness has, for several years now, uh, it sponsored a variety of natural science researches, especially investigation into like e insect ecologies, uh, energy budgets, and symbiotic relationships. Uh, the organization does this to contribute its share to the pool of scientific research that we need to save the planet. Uh, I don't know how well you're acquainted with uh, the ongoing crisis 
but I can assure you that recent efforts to downplay the significance of a degrading environment stem from scientific misrepresentations and the grossest of economic motives. Everyday lost cannot be regained and may in the end prove to be our undoing. Some of the researches in symbiosis have been conducted jointly with a company in town called Don Biozyme. Uh, it's a corporation that's headquartered in the eastern suburb of San Damiel. Now, this last week, I received a personal call from a Dr. Peter Tate of Don Biozyme, who swore that some of Full Wilderness's money was being misused for the foulest purposes, as he said. Uh, just what he was alarmed about, he didn't make clear. My concern is that Don Biozyme has been gene splicing bacteria or insects without satisfying uh, formal procedures required by the state of California and by the federal government. And you can well imagine that injection of such creatures into the ecosystem could have the most disastrous consequences for earthly life. It's hard to imagine it. But some sort of the some of these new life creations, they're being considered for patenting and trademarking. It's 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 beyond imagination. It's not discovery. It's uh, it's not knowledge that they're after. It's money. Have you read uh, Michael Crichton's book uh, Jurassic Park? It's terrifying. It's terrifying to think. So I checked him out. This Dr. Tate. And he proved to be a, a Don Biozyme microbiologist. He's listed on the Biozyme staff, and he's on their phone rosters. Uh, here, let me give you a, a little background sheet of, uh, of uh, Mr. Tate uh, for your records. How long have you been working with Don Biozyme? Uh, it's been a couple of years. Uh, not since they started, but, uh, and but you had a reason to think that they were an ethical organization when you first interacted. No, not really. Uh. Um, of course, you know, money is a big motivator, so you never know what these sort of people are getting into. Uh, we obviously can't police every single aspect of every single company we work with. There's other companies we work with around the, the globe for the same reason. Uh, you can see Mr. Tate's uh, the 29 years old. Uh, we got his address, his description and everything, uh, all of his uh, education, his employment history and so forth. Um, but here's the thing. Uh, he was going to send me something but he feared exposure and the loss of employment, obviously. Yes. Well, he did send me something. He sent it UPS, amazingly. Uh, just a moment. And he gets on the phone and he's like, oh, would you have Lance and Young bring the specimen to my office? And then he turns back to you and he says, now I need to tell you this, Dr. Tate has disappeared sometime in the last few days. Uh, his dented and damaged car was found abandoned up at Seacliff Palisades Park in a quiet residential neighborhood. How far away from the Dawn Biozyme is that? Is that a short drive? Oh, maybe five or ten minutes. Uh -huh. so uh, local. Based, yeah, based, this is all local. Based on the evidence found in the car, the police believe that Tate committed suicide. Uh, they make that guess, though, based mostly, uh, mostly on the fact that his car is abandoned, okay? Uh, the detective in charge of that case is uh, uh, Norman Martinez. Martinez, I think is how he pronounces it. Uh, Tate's disappearance will be an important part of your investigation, but, but I'm afraid <laughs> it gets much worse. Much, much stranger still. Ah. Mm. Uh, this arrived uh, by messenger the day that Tate disappeared. And at that moment, uh, two men come into the room wheeling a kind of a 
a table. Maybe it's about four feet long and about three feet wide. And setting on top of it is something covered in a tarpaulin, also about three more feet high and fairly wide. And you can hear a bit of a noise coming from inside. And a few moments later, your noses are hit with a very fetid sort of smell. Jadik walks over to it and with a sudden flourish and a ta-da, this is what he reveals. And immediately the thing becomes extremely active and it starts screeching and making the most ungodly noise. It writhes around inside this this plexiglass container and uh, it oozes goo and its little mouths click open and closed and uh, he he just like uh, this is this is this monstrosity is uh, is just unbelievable what in the hell do you have there Mr. J. Tick I mean God only knows. God only knows what the purpose of this monstrosity is. Uh, he says, how, long have, "How long have you had this in your possession?" Just, just, just since uh, uh, day before yesterday, it, it put one of my it put one of my employees in the hospital. It says uh, Tate somehow had drugged the thing, and it arrived here limp in in this cylinder. Uh, we thought that it had died. There was no heartbeat, and suddenly it jumped our resident zoologist and bit off her left thumb. Uh, the teeth are razor sharp. Now she's suing us because we wouldn't kill the thing to get her thumb back. Oh, my. Wow. Uh, yeah. It, uh, it came with a note. Uh, here. And he just hands it to you. Uh, whoever wants to read it. Dear Mr. JTIC, dated July 26, 1991. This situation is so upsetting to me that I am unable to function effectively. I really don't know how to reply to your questions. There are so many things to explain and so many places I could start. Now that I'm involved, I need a few days to compose a methodical presentation, which you can use to create a plan of action. I have to be careful. There is no telling what they would do if they knew what I have done. Per the enclosed specimen, please follow the instructions carefully. This creature has something to do with the work being done here. Enough of these things have died that I can fake the death of one more. Feeding instructions. The specimen currently eats a diet of six parts raw hamburger, four parts freshly killed insects, diptera larva preferred, one part bone mill, in total of one kilogram per, tilo- per 10 kilograms of body mass. It does not appear to ingest liquids directly, though a colleague believes that it does better in higher humidities. Since acquisition has grown slowly, weigh it weekly and increase feeding proportionally. Dr. Peter Tate. So you can see, gentlemen, what we might be up against. This is, this is the worst kind of genetic manipulation of of uh, any like anything I've ever seen. Uh, nobody's seen anything like this. I shudder to think that something like this could get turned loose in a favorable environment. Yeah, so I'm be... also concerned about the use of the word acquisition in Tate's note. It sounds like they didn't grow it, but they found it somewhere. I don't know. But nothing like this exists in any ecology that I've ever heard. He's talking about having multiple of them. Right. I'm not sure I'm upset that a lot of them have died on. Um, at, at this point, it starts to screech incessantly. And so, uh, uh, like, you know, me, please come back inside and take this out. Uh, take, it, take it to the loading dock. Uh, he says, so here's, here's what we need to know to make a case. This, this, Is this thing the result of illegal genetic experimentation? Uh, I want you to collect as much evidence as possible so that we can get it stopped. But quite honestly, and between you and me, the reason I chose you 
is because if this proves to be completely legal, I still want it stopped. You understand what I'm asking you to possibly do in the name of protecting our planet. Oh. I I do. What and, kind of access do you have legally to Don Biozyme? Well, that's one thing. I have set up a, uh, uh, I, I've set up for you to take a tour of Don Biozyme. And you should be able to do it. In, you know, you can say that you are uh, biologists uh, working with uh, full wilderness, um, and that uh, you're just you're just sitting over here to to look around. You know, nothing in particular. Um, so, what this and there's nothing. The research that they're doing for you is in small plant and animal ecologies? Yeah, I don't think that has anything to do with, with any of this. It's, uh, it's almost an insignificant stuff that they're working on for us. Uh, uh, just, you know, how, how insects relate to uh, certain uh, crops and uh, how they can be better... Uh, how they can be better, uh, I don't know. I don't know all the science behind it. Uh, I can I can definitely have my people put together uh, a list uh, and uh, and a, a background on on all of that if you really think that it's important. Um, but uh, uh, let's get let's get the money part out of the way. Miss Novesky, could you please come in and? Uh, Clarice Novesky comes in. She's uh, about 35. Uh, she's a stunningly beautiful woman, but very, uh, she gives you that sort of icy feel. Just, she's all secretary and nothing else. Very serious. Um, so she sits down with her leg crossed at a little note pad, and she's like, uh, gentlemen, I believe that what we were going to offer you was $10,000. Uh, plus, uh, we are willing to compensate you five thousand dollars a month uh, until we no longer require your services. Uh, plus, and she gives you a uh, a debit card, and she says uh, we're providing you with uh, three hundred and fifty dollars per diem for whatever you might need. If there's anything else, if that's acceptable, then I'll have you sign these non-disclosure forms. Uh, and uh, if you're all still on board. I'm very impressed that you showed us the beastie before we even signed any paperwork. Well, I trust that you're scientists. Agree. I, uh, of course, uh, look over the contract. You know, uh, my mom told me not to sign anything without reading it, and then after I see that it's all in order, I uh, sign away. That's very standard. All right. Um, Even with our credentials, I don't think anyone would believe that. True. No. So, gentlemen, uh, in addition, if uh, uh, if you get into some sort of trouble, uh, Full Wilderness has literally tens of thousands of local and national contacts. We've got a lot of scientists and staff members, even at Don Biasign, there are members of, Don, of, of Full Wilderness. Uh, we're as much a philosophical organization as one devoted to practical ends. And consequently, we have influence at every level of government. So if you need the way smooth on something, uh, we can help. Thank you. Okay. I, I do have a question for you, Mr. Uh, JTIC. Um, uh, has anyone been in contact with uh, Dr. Tate's next of kin? I believe it was Edward Tate. I, I don't know. Okay. Yeah. I thought maybe he might have some information. Right. Maybe some clues. Possibly. That's, yeah. that's something for you to find out. Um, also, uh, we need to move this creature to a better location uh, so that we can further study it. Uh, last year, uh, we bought a lab out in the east of town, Zimvitech Labs. Uh, they were doing cosmetic product testing on animals. Disgusting. Uh, we hired a small staff uh, for more environmental studies. Uh, but when we received this, 
we had them set up a much better examination facility. I want you to take the specimen over there. Uh, they should all be set up by now. Uh, you'll be working with a Dr. Uh, Morton Leem. Uh, he's a good man. Uh, Richard, please join us. Uh, Richard, Mr. Slakes here, who you've already met. Uh, he'll accompany you. Uh, gentlemen, uh, well, doctors, uh, I'd like uh, I'd like you to send me regular reports uh, on your progress through this ca through council member Richard here. I have a number of events and meetings that I have to attend. Uh, so send him your reports and keep me apprised of anything you find. Uh, you're in good hands with him. So unless there's any more questions you might have that I can answer, uh, please save us all by stopping whatever they're doing over there do you have any uh, do you have any guidelines or restrictions about injury to that thing and its disposal and how transparent is this going to be in the end do we bring in law enforcement if we find out that that uh don biozyme is in fact in violation of some law or do we have to keep this quiet well, uh, law enforcement wouldn't have anything to do with that kind of a thing. You bring the information to me and we can put together a thing where we can have them legally shut down. You know, we'll have to follow those sort of, sort of uh, directions. On the other hand, if you find out that something has happened to Mr. Tate and that somebody had gone by as I was there, I don't see how the police can't get involved at that point. Um, I... Uh, I uh, I think that uh, try to use some discretion. Don't just go in there and confront them directly because we are at least in some way tied to them mm -hmm. uh, financially. And uh, so we don't want to cause that kind of a scandal. But uh, do whatever is necessary, you know. And uh, as you, you saw in the disclosure thing, you know, you're... You, <laughs> anyway, I'm I'm sorry to lay all that on you all of a sudden, and I'm cer certainly it's not a laughing matter. I guess I tend to laugh a little when I'm nervous, but um, I have a lot of other things to work on as well. So, gentlemen, ladies, please uh, get to it. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Gatick. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we'll be in touch. It's a pleasure to meet you. I'll uh, I'll take them down to the uh, the loading dock. Uh, gentlemen, please come with me. All right, Richard. How many people around here have seen that thing? Oh, uh, not many. Yeah, just just a handful. A couple of people in the labs. I and you do right. have labs on site, but nobody's taken any tissue samples from that or anything. Uh, I have no idea about that. Uh, like like uh, we're we're really limited here. We really have a. Uh, you know, it's basically a room with a microscope in it. It's about all we have here. So I heard about the accident that uh, that our zoologist had be, be, being bitten by it. I always, she thought it was dead, you know. Right. Well, so, we'll definitely want to get some uh, protection for our glove, for our hands, if we're going to be uh, even trying to get a sample of that thing. Well, they'll be they'll be setting up a whole. They've set up a whole facility over there at Zenvitech. You should have every every piece of equipment that you can possibly want. Excellent, excellent. Uh, Is there a head scientist extant over there, or are we the team for that? Uh, no, the, I think that's Doctor Morton Leem. Oh, right, Leem. Yeah, yeah. He's he's in charge over there, and I, I believe he's been informed, though I don't think that he's seen the thing yet. Ugh. So it'll be interesting to see his face when he does. So what we got to do is we got to go downstairs to the loading dock, and I've already got I've got a, a van down there. And we're gonna have to load this thing in the van, and then we're gonna have to drive over to Zymphotech. Now, uh, I'm a little embarrassed to say that I don't drive. Uh, I, oh. I was I was born and raised in Manhattan, and uh, we don't we don't drive. We uh, use public transportation. Nobody it's, it's just not cost effective to have a car. So one of you guys is gonna have to drive. But I can tell you which way to go. Oh, well, I mean, I have no problem problem driving. I've lived in California 
for most of my adult life. So oh, good, good. It'll be, it'll be fine. Whereabouts in California? Oh, uh, down in Berkeley is where where uh, where it was. We went there for some uh, help. My dad get he was uh, down there to get maybe some research, see if they could cure him. When it didn't work, I uh, stayed on, and then I now teach at the university. So. Huh? Berkeley's an interesting place. A lot of homeless people there. There are, there are, but you know, uh, it's also uh, a lot of good people out there. So, so I got got a lot of vegetarian food out there that's really kind of good. I've had some of it; it's really nice. He says, but uh, you know, uh, so let's 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 on head on down. Uh, yeah, yeah, I hope. I, I you know, now like 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 Robert said, you know, he's uh, wants you to uh, get a hold of me anytime you need something. Um, Here's my, uh, and he gives you his card. You know, here's mm-hmm. my number. Um, uh, I think probably he'd like you to write something out each each chance you get. It doesn't have to be every night, but probably at least every other night. Uh, just keep a surprise to what's going on. Uh, so he takes you down the elevator, and it opens up onto the loading dock. And uh, you look at the van. And it's just a, a white van that's pulled up to the um, the loading dock so that they can wheel the, the cart and the thing, and it's still got the tarpaulin over it. Uh, but there's only room for the driver and Slakes to sit up in the front, and the rest you've got to get in the back. And there's not really any place to sit. And how are you going to secure the the table and the, the specimen. Well, is there any kind of uh, strapping inside the van? If it's yeah, we can get some straps. Yeah, let's strap this thing in here. Because I yeah. was going to request if I could be in the back to observe it during transportation. Yeah. Now, there's no windows in the back except in the back doors. Okay. Right. And it's, it's nondescript. There's nothing written on the van. Oh, good. Good, yeah, not free candy. Uh, so, uh, do the the table is a rolling table? I, do the uh, do the casters lock? Yeah, I've got little locking casters. Yeah, we'll, we'll definitely want to do it, that. It's it's only about a ten or a fifteen minute drive. Mister Mister Slake, do we have any more uh, sedatives? Well, we don't know what what Tate used to make it sedate like that. We don't have a clue. All right. So. I'm sorry, uh, Mr. Did you feed it? I don't know if they've been feeding it or not, but uh, it's certainly making a racket. And it stinks, it stinks to high heaven. Yeah. yeah. What does that smell like? Like like sour milk and donkey shit. I don't know. Ugh. It's, it's nasty. Awful. It's awful. <clears throat> There's not much we know about it. I mean, giving it the wrong sedative could kill it. Mm. Yeah, and it, before we study it, that'd be uh, a real shame because then maybe we might lose some uh, info and be able to figure out what's going on. So, uh, so I look around the van. Are there any like eye holes or anything that we could run the straps through to tie it down? Well, let's say there's some structural things, you know, that are okay. that are meant for strapping mm-hmm. stuff in there. Yeah, we lost it's- Morgan. <laughs> It's it's canister as plexiglass. Uh, yes, it would seem that. How thick is it? Uh, it looks like it's about an inch thick. Uh, there are some very small air holes that are in it, which is why you can smell it. Uh, uh, it um, it has what looks like a locking mechanism on the top that there's there's no way that the top could pop off. You know, not right. without. I mean, you couldn't drop it out of an airplane, but uh, <laughs> um, you couldn't accidentally pop the top, right? Yeah, you know, by hitting something. I still think we should keep it uh, covered until we get to the lab. It seems to be a little quieter when it's covered. Uh, yeah, I don't want to listen to it while I'm driving. I can't. Won't be able to. Ugh. So, okay, yeah, well. Yeah, Sticking its little tendril out of an air hole into my nose, either. Yeah, it's, it doesn't seem to be able to do that. That's good. Um, 
Are there any deep gashes in the plexiglass? Well, the, right now it's all covered in the tarp. Uh, oh. You didn't see anything like that. Okay. You didn't see any scratch. Although there is kind of a coating of slime. It seems to be exuding some sort of an oogie, oozy slime. Um, and you're also, quite honestly, you're not sure if that's, it looks like plexiglass. It doesn't look like glass, but it might be some sort of a, a specialized uh, plastic that's resistant to something, you know. It's obviously from a medical lab of some sort, not one here. Right. And yeah. something that looks highly specialized. So, all do, right. Do you know that if it was, um, was it shipped to them in this container? Uh yeah, apparently it was shipped via UPS. Wow. That's maybe there was a cardboard box involved as well. I, I yeah. imagine. I imagine. All right. Yeah, yeah, there was uh there was a big old industrial cardboard box it was shoved into. And but like I say, when it arrived it wasn't moving at all. We thought it was dead. Yeah. How are we coming on getting us strapped down back there, gentlemen? I think we're pretty good. Why don't you guys all do a luck roll? Oh, jeez. I smelled that coming. I got <laughs> dice. Come on, Dane Dice. I got an 11. 33. 90. 69 out of 40. Okay. Don't worry, guys. I got an 8. Yeah. Okay, cool. Two extreme successes, I hope. <laughs> All right. Will be fine. <clears throat> so Robert gets in the passenger side and uh, Heather gets in the front. And uh, the rest of you, how are you guys going to brace yourself? Are you going to try to stand up and ride or sit down the wall or? Against the wall. Yeah, I think squatting braced in a corner. Yeah, okay. I'm, I'm, I'm going to sit down. I'm, my knees aren't as good as they used to be. <laughs> well, uh, the minute the, the, the van starts to move, the creature becomes agitated. And you can hear it. Uh, you can hear the sound of its little teeth clicking together, which is perhaps the most unnerving part of the, uh, the whole thing. Um, you can hear it thumping around inside the glass and making that horrible screeching noise so badly that sometimes you have to plug your ears. It has a way of sort of like like nails on a chalkboard just sort of eating its way into your brain. Um, Heather, do a spot hidden. Right. Success. Okay. So uh, you've traveled down uh, Margarita Street and and you get to Ashter Avenue, and you're at the light, and the light turns green, and you start to go, and you notice behind you, coming up rather quickly, are a couple of motorcycles. Um, they look like they're tricked out a bit. They're probably Harleys, uh, and there are two big bikers uh, look like two big male bikers with beards, like Hell's Angels, right. uh, riding on them with their girlfriends claiming it, clinging on back. Um, and they're passing some of the cars that are farther behind you, uh, but they're heading in your direction, uh, and it looks like they're positioning some, themselves so that there will be one on each side. Okay. Well, so I, well, I'm picturing they're kind of coming between the cars that are stopped, but we've got a green light, correct? Right. All right. Well, well this is after you've already started going again. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So I, I uh, kind of uh, keep an eye on it, you know, uh, looking s sides of my eyes out the uh, side view mirrors, and I, I speed up some bit, a bit. Okay. And uh, are they matching me? Well, uh, everybody in the back. You can definitely feel that the car suddenly speeds up. You can feel that it accelerates, um, which doesn't feel quite right because it feels like it's accelerating. 
And once again, the only way that you can see out is through the back windows. Um, Does the creature re react to the acceleration like at all? Not any more than it is. It's just being really annoying. Okay. That sound. And so um, is it, sorry, is the creature is it trying to like get at us through the glass? Is it kind of just sitting, kind of like walking around? It, it's covered in a tarpaulin, so you don't know. Okay, we can't. Okay. All you can do is hear it. Well, I was gonna ask whoever's in the passenger seat to see if they could, if there's a radio in the van. Uh, sometimes in the animal enclosures, we used to put on some classical music, and sometimes that would soothe some of the animals. Well, do you want to kind of yell that through the wall to the person sitting in the in the seat? Well, we have. There's no. The van is separate from the the seat. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I didn't realize that. Okay. Yeah. Is it more like a box truck than a van van? Yeah, kind of. So it's, I'm, I'm thinking like a like more like a moving van than like a uh, 1960s uh, Volkswagen van van. Okay, that's what I was thinking. All right, so then I disregard that. Um, you hear Robert suddenly say, "What in Jesus Christ's name is this all about?" And uh, uh, Heather looked back again to a spot hidden. Oh, yeah, pass. Yeah. Now you can see that a black van has pulled off a side street, and the two bikers and the black van are together, and they've made their way so that they're behind you. And you notice something else at that moment that just suddenly strikes you as odd. The girls on the back of the motorcycles seem to be carrying something. It looks like boxes that you would deliver flowers in hmm. you're holding them like this right okay well uh i don't like where this is going so i'm assuming uh you know it's not a too busy street i'm gonna if it's not i'm gonna punch i'm gonna put the pedal onto the ground okay well you've come to another uh intersection uh this one sort of angles off um kind of forward and right, and it turns back to the left. But uh, Slakes is telling you you need to either keep going forward or you need to turn. Either way will take you ultimately to uh, Highway 99. Okay. I'm going to go the way that has the least sharp turn. Okay. Well, then that's just to keep going forward. Right. Okay. Yep. Um, the motorcycles pull up on the side of the, the van on either side. And... You notice as they do that uh, these are these guys are dressed like what you'd expect bikers to be dressed like. Uh, one of them does not have a helmet. One of them has a little German spiked helmet. <laughs> um, uh, both of them have full beards. Uh, they've got uh, you know, iron crosses and rebel flags on their shirts. Their their denim shirts and uh, they're wearing. Uh, they're wearing uh, blue jeans, and uh, you can see that on one of the girl's shirts, uh, you see three letters um, that are done in a sort of fancy, uh, I want to say like old English calligraphy, that sort of gothic uh, um, style. Uh, it's GLC is what you're seeing. GLC. Yeah, and it's obviously as part of a design that's in their jackets. Um, by now, everybody in the back has noticed from the shifting and moving of the van that something must be up. Yeah, we could probably hear motorcycles, too, if they're riding. Yeah, you can hear the motorcycles. Harleys are pretty fucking loud. Yeah. <laughs> What's going on up there? Hi. I'm going to peel myself up and have a look out the back window, too. Okay. Uh, what you see, just as you look out the back window, is the two motorcycles pull out of, out of your sight up towards the sides of the van, and you see a big black van right behind you with a couple of people that you can sort of barely make out through their tinted window, but they look like they're wearing suits of some sort. Uh, they don't and look like... And they're focused on us. So they're not driving. They're not casual people on the freeway. 
Right. They, you're, you're almost dead sure that the motorcyclists moved forward when one of the guys in the van sort of, you know, did this. What the hell? Uh, and, and we're saying, and this is also like a moving van, but it's, it's black and it's got tinted windows. So it does not also look like a casual suburban vehicle. Correct. Yeah. It looks like it's in way better shape than the white van that you guys are in. <laughs> What do you what do you see in Flores? It looks like we've got. Uh, it looks like somebody is accompanying us uninvited. I don't know if I'm being paranoid, but uh, I got a cup. There's a couple of suits in a black van that's right on our ass. Does do you think that? Uh, well, yeah. Do you think I our just, secret's out? No, I think. Um... Well, I hope it's not the people who uh, ha may have had a hand in uh, the disappearance of uh, Dr. Tate. It's kind of hard not to associate the two, right? Man, I don't like this one bit. Heather, about that time you notice, uh, well, Robert, uh, I'm sorry, uh, Richard uh, uh, gives kind of a, a startled uh, noise. And you also notice that the girls have dropped the boxes uh and they have uzis thanks uh okay so i'm going to uh i hope the guys in the back are hanging on because now are they they got the uzis and once they start even moving in toward the aim at me i'm gonna slam the brake on right well you can see from their movements that your guess is what's going to happen is in a few moments one of them is going to move forward and they're going to try to block your path and stop you. I'm not sure that they want to shoot you. Okay. But they definitely want to stop you. All right. I uh, yell over at Richard as, like, uh, you know, uh, hey, where's the nearest police station? Because I'm thinking maybe I can get there. Lots of times I'll leave you alone. He I was like, you know what? That's all the way on the, cro on the other side of town. But you know what? We got the, the highway coming up here in just a second. You should be able to get on that. I don't see how they're going to. Try anything once you get on the highway, because uh, there's no place to stop. I hear you. Well, let's go. They haven't forced us to stop yet. All right. Now, if we're jostling around, I'm going to yeah. try and focus on the the straps and the container to make sure it's not, you know, being compromised. Well, there's a couple of moments when you're when you're starting to wonder if you've tied those straps tight enough because you know they're making that sort of thing as the as the van lurches a little to the side and back. So, uh, Jason, go ahead and do a strength. Uh, I mean, a, a, a spot. Um, sorry, a luck roll. Luck roll. Got it. Yeah. Fifteen, one five. Okay. Uh, well, let's say that with your with your since you're sitting, your feet. Uh, you are able to sort of push on the gurney or whatever it is and, and keep it pretty stable where it is. So it's shaking. And now the creature is starting to screech more because it's, you're, you guys are jostling around a little bit. Now, um, from my background and my animal handling and stuff, do I have, do I think I could even attempt to try and calm this thing down at all? Or it's just so unknown that, I don't know. What do you want to try? Well, I've cl uh, dropped connection before when it was being described, so I kind of lost exactly what what it was. So. Oh, you didn't see it? I saw it for like a split second, and then my connection dropped. So I didn't hear any discussion about it. So Okay. So let me show it's it to you again. Ugly. It doesn't like belong anywhere in the classification of actual life on this planet. That's what yeah. I figured from my sort for like maybe face only a mother could love. Wow. <laughs> uh, right. it's, black to go. It it rises around, it it kicks, it screeches, it clicks its little teeth. It doesn't uh, even have a face where I can try and yeah. No. Okay. Did uh Ed, did you hear the part where Jadik said that they're being sued because the zoologist got her thumb bit off? I heard it yeah. okay. in <laughs> Like you guys discussing it, but I didn't know exactly what happened. All right, so I'll just right. Got stung, but okay. Yeah. So disregard that whole last statement. <laughs> okay. So would you say she gave it the finger? Yeah, she <laughs> gave it the thumb. <laughs> I now think she walks around the collar. Her. The collar nine fingers. No more hitchhiking for her. 
All right, mm -hmm. so I'm just going to concentrate on keeping it as stable as possible. Okay. All right, so one of the motorcycles begins to move forward, and you know that he's about to try to keep you from getting on the, the freeway. Uh, there are cross streets. Uh, there are right-hand turns that you theoretically could make and still get to the highway at some point, but uh, what do you want to do? All right, well, if, he, if he's doing the, if he's uh, starting to get in front of me, and I'm a doctor, I'm not a homicidal maniac, so I am going to try and uh, turn, turn, to, turn to the right, you know. I know that it's going fast, so. Okay, uh, why don't you go ahead and do a drive roll. Uh, no. <laughs> All right. Um, so you, you get to the curb, the light is green and, uh, you screech around the corner, hopefully to throw some of them off. Um, the, the, the one that is ahead of you, uh, was the one that was on your, uh, your right hand side. So he continues through the intersection and the other one sort of careens uh, uh, halfway across the street and then tries to come back without crashing into the cars that are sitting there. Um, I want everybody in the back to do dex rolls. <laughs> I pass with a 37. 90, 96. I failed not as drastically, 58 for 50. Okay. Too okay, so uh, Morgan and uh, or uh, Dr. Margaret, Dr. Evans, and Dr. Leash, uh, you managed to hold on for dear life. Uh, Jason, because you're pre pre pressing against that with your foot, uh, your back slides and you just suddenly go careening uh, against the back door. Uh, and Desmond, uh, you get hit by him since you were looking out the back. And uh, you get knocked on the ground as well. And you all stare at that, uh, that cart as it vibrates and it looks like it's going to come loose. Uh, but it doesn't. And if, uh, if there's a lock on the back doors, I will try to slam it before we fly out the back of the vehicle. Uh, there's a key lock, but I, th I don't know how that would lock. Like, this kind of lock or I don't know what. Um, but the doors don't open. And I, I did a luck roll. You, you don't crash into a pole or anything like that. Um, so uh, the van behind you, the black van, screeches around the corner as well. But it's lost some time. And now they're a little bit back. And you come up to the, uh, the on-ramp to the uh, 99 uh, going, across, going uh, north. But the light's red. What do you do? All right. Well, uh, I'm going to do the quick look back and forth, blast the horn. And uh, unless I see a car, you know, coming that I know that's going to T-bone me, I'm going to keep on going through it. Okay. Blast, do, a luck, blast the horn. do a luck roll. <sighs> nope. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Okay. Um, so what happens is uh, you, you turn to get on the freeway. Another car is coming. Uh, you very nearly hit. Maybe you even bump a little bit. Um, his car slides, your car slides, but uh, you just keep going. That's right. Bumping's okay. racing. And uh, so now you're on the highway. Um, uh, you can see that up ahead, you are heading for a bridge. Uh, it's the bridge that goes over the San Damiel River. Uh, you cross that and do a spot hidden for me. Ah, missed it by two. Okay. All right. Um, you, hear, you hear Richard, and he's like, holy crap, one of them's coming. And you, you uh, he says, there's one on the... On the right-hand side, uh, 
Uh, they're still a ways away, but they're coming up, and the girl's waving that uh, that Uzi. Like, like, who are these people? Do you have any? Who do you even know who the GLC is? I I don't know what GLC is. That's that's looks like some sort of gang. I don't know why they're after us. I mean, I can think of only one reason why they're after yeah. us. Why they're after us. Or how they know that we're, how they knew that we're in the van, that don't make no sense. Well, it doesn't matter how they knew right now, but they're on us now. So they pull up along the side of you, on on Richard's side, and uh, they pull up a little bit ahead, uh, and the girl sort of looking back over her shoulder, and she starts waving that Uzi. Like she's telling you to pull over or she's going to shoot. Um, Heather, do another spot hidden for me. Nope. Okay. Um, I want to know, you're, you're on the freeway. You're going like 60 miles an hour at this point. Yeah. Um, and uh, and Robert tells you that you're going to be getting off. You're going to be getting on the the 38. Uh, so you're going to you're the junction's coming up up ahead. Uh, do you want to do anything? Uh, crazy, reckless, or just keep driving? No, no, I, I don't want to do anything crazy, reckless. Uh, you know, I'm. Yeah, I know. I got these those guys in the back. I don't. I don't want to do that. And you know, I'm kind of of the mindset. Hey, you know, they they're really going to force me over. I'm gonna gonna pull over. I don't feel like getting shot today. Okay, so you're gonna pull over into the emergency lane on the freeway. Uh yeah, yeah. Okay, so you start to pull over into the into the emergency lane. And guys, you can all now feel that the truck is, that the van is, is decelerating. And you hear Robert Sykes being like, oh no, what the hell are you doing? You're going to stop? Yeah. You, you know, they got, they're, they got guns. They're going to shoot us. Man, you know, they shoot us when we're driving. We're really done for. Well, what if they shoot us anyway? He says, it's always the chance. We got. I, I don't like this. God damn. I wish we had a gun. I always knew I should have carried a gun with me everywhere I went. <laughs> well, you know. All right, so you pull over, and the motorcycle pulls up maybe 20 feet ahead of you. And the two of them get off. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, but they only come up maybe 10 feet closer, and... The girl just basically is pointing the Uzi at you, but they're not doing anything. Obviously, they're waiting for the van, mm -hmm. the black van, to show up. What do you guys in the back want to do? Once Ethan and I have untangled our limbs, I'm going to stick my, you know, face up in the window again and see if I can learn anything more about what's going on. But Well, unfortunately, from the back, you can't see anything. All you see is the freeway. All right. And the black van isn't behind us anymore? No, not yet. What's going on up there? I have no idea. This is crazy. Am I am I able to hear them yelling kind of? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I got a, it. Yeah, the van's not burn, burning. Yeah, I, I kind of yell back. I'm like, oh, we got people with guns. Take off. Oh, okay. So they got... Uh, how far away from their motorcycle are they? They're about 10 feet from their motorcycle and they're about 10 feet from you. Okay, it's a straight shot to the motorcycle? Pretty much. All right, well, why not? Let's press our, press our luck. I'm just going to uh, slant, I'm going to kind of, you know, duck down below the, uh, I call it the bulkhead of the, uh, of the van, right. you know, that way if they shoot, it's going to hit the engine block instead of my head. <laughs> and I'm, I'm going to go straight. I'm going to hope I hear the, hear the bump and crunch of a motorcycle and hopefully okay. not, not a skull. <laughs> uh, well, why don't you do a luck roll? Come on, baby. Everybody hang on. 
<laughs> by one. I made it by one. Okay. What happens is, is as you lurch forward, all of a sudden, uh, the motorcycle guy grabs his girlfriend, and they both tumble to the side to get out of the way. And you do clip his uh, the front wheel of his motorcycle and knock it over, uh, which is going to delay him at least a little bit. Uh, at the same moment, uh, Desmond, uh, you start to notice the black van on the freeway uh, getting ready to pull into the, uh, the safety area, um, at which point you are flattened against the door because <laughs> the van suddenly lurches forward. Everybody else do a, a, a dex roll to see if you fall. Now, if he hit the, the wheel of the bike, there's a good chance that that, that wheel is warped now. 05. 96. Okay. I, I am uh, at the window with Desmond now. All right. Uh, Margaret, you slide. And uh, we'll say that you slide right into the, uh, the back of the van uh, next, to, uh, next to Desmond. Uh, I want to start looking, pull pull up the rug at the back of the van. Is there a rug? Is there any toolkits or a jack or anything in the back? I probably should know more about vans. Um, well, if it, is it a cargo okay. van okay. or is it? Well, it's more of a cargo van, but let's say that there is uh, like a spare tire area and a a jack. Yeah, maybe a hand cart or anything in there. Or What's a hand cart? Like the thing that you, the dolly that you has two wheels on the bottom for moving. Oh no, the there's, no, there's nothing like that. They actually took that out because it's big. They needed to put the cart in there, and there's not enough room for that. But uh, there's definitely a, a a jack, and there's a a thing to to do the tire. You know the tire the lug, the lug notes. Yeah. Okay. Um. So. The van that's behind you immediately pulls out also back into traffic. Um, but the, uh, the motorcycle got knocked over, and you see them struggling to ride it again because motorcycles are really heavy. Um, by then, you get to the 38 junction, and you start heading down the 38. And uh, after just, just uh, 30 seconds or so, uh, Richard's like, here, get off here, get off here. We're almost there. And uh, you get off the thing and you, you go for a little while. Now you're kind of in a semi-wooded area. Uh, and uh, he says, this is it right here. And there's a driveway going into a cleared area where there is a, a large one-story building uh, with a gigantic letter Z uh in in orange and you can see that the side of the building says zimvatech lab and as you pull in there uh, a couple seconds later you see the van go by it's not going to follow you that far um and richard's like holy shit holy shit <sighs> Wow. Oh my God. Uh, uh, yeah, so you, you, you know that black van has any of your compadres? No. Okay. All I can say is that somebody found out. I mean, unless it's something else, but. Ugh. Well, well, we're here. Let's get this this damn thing inside because I'm I'm gonna need a a, a drink or something because yeah. my hands are shaking. <laughs> I tell you, why don't you, you park right over here, and I'm gonna go inside and I'm gonna talk to Doctor Lehm and get him all ready, and then then what we'll have you do is pull over to the dock. But let me get them all ready. So uh, okay. Okay. park right over here. Maybe let the guys out of the back. They probably got vomit all over the place. Oh. Yeah, yeah. Sorry, guys. <laughs> and uh, he gets out and he goes inside. And uh, Zivitech Labs looks like it's a, a. I mean, you guys have seen biotech labs and stuff like that before. It looks like an average, not not even top of the line. Maybe a little bit older uh, building. It's got the giant Z, which is really uh, kind of garish. Um, 
but you know, Simvatech. Um, the property is not surrounded by a fence or anything like that. It, it actually looks kind of nice. The 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 plantings and the the grass. Uh, the grass actually, when you look at it, it kind of gives you a funny feeling, like. It's all exactly the same color, like maybe it's not real or it's dyed or, or something. Um, and uh, anyways, Richard goes in there and he's in there for maybe uh, 20 minutes or so. And then you see him walking back to where you are. And uh, he gets, gets about halfway back to you and he's like, you know, and he points to the dock like this. And by now you can see a couple of, scientists in lab coats have stepped out onto the dock. One of them looks a little bit older than the others. And uh, he has you pull over to there. Okay. So I, of course, do that. All right. So um, you pull up to the dock and uh, a couple of these tech guys and scientists come out and uh, one of them is a fairly older man. Uh, he comes immediately up to you. Gentlemen, gentlemen, I, I heard you were coming. Uh, uh, any problems? <laughs> he says, Mr. Mr. Slakes has said you had quite the run-in with somebody. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it, it, was, it was surreal. I, I've never had anything like that in my life. Oh, oh, I'm just glad you all made it in one piece. Yeah. He says, uh, so, uh, so, so, so this is our lab. Uh, we've been working here for a little while. We mostly study commercial possibilities of bacteria as food sources for humans. And of course, for like oil eaters and selenium fixers and mineral concentrators, stuff like that. But uh, most of the labs are empty. Uh, corporate won't know what to do with them until uh, next year. The, the budget plan is complete. Uh, we can use this uh, this lab for several months without any interference. I've uh, already gotten the space allocated. Uh, so let's see what we got here. Now, before I wanted to like look at the art, the team of doctors, and say, should should we have the main, the head doctor, look at this before all the assistants? Maybe he should dismiss them. Oh, no, I'm, I'm 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 Doctor Lee. Yeah, I'm I'm the head. Well, well, maybe, uh, Dr. Lane, maybe um, you, you should come into the van with us and maybe leave your assistants outside. Trust me on this one for just, just humor me. Well, all right, if, if you think that's necessary. Gentlemen, would you please, uh, I'll call you in a few minutes to help me with this. I mean, we're all going to be studying this. So uh, he said it was some sort of a weird sort of specimen. Uh, let yeah. me take a look. Your guest of honor here is a little bit on the. Uh, it's making a terrible racket. Ugh. A bit of the weird side. And a terrible well, smell. Let's uh, let's see what we got here. And he uh, pulls the thing off. Oh my god. Oh, he says Jadik said this was something special, but uh, who could have dreamed of this? So now that we can see it, is it pressed up against the glass? Like, is it trying to get? Yeah, it uh, it seems to be. Uh, do a spot hidden for me. This makes this spot hidden. Uh, Forty four. That's just a regular pass. Well, it seems that if any of you move, the creature lurches towards that side of the glass, uh, as if it's attracted to movement. So if I start doing this, it goes after that hand. And right. Just, it, okay. it immediately sort of, yeah, makes movements as if it's designed to attack anything that moves. How's Dr. the... Go ahead. No, Dr. Carlisle, what, what do you make of this? That's what I was going to... That's you, Jason. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I thought he was... <laughs> this This must be some like genetically altered weapon weaponized I, I i need to study it more i i i i i i may disagree i don't think this is any sort of recombinant creature this is this is something quite unique i don't yeah. even recognize 
you know, if this is recombinant DNA, if they've, they've spliced some sort of thing together, I don't see any evidence of any particular part that I recognize. You know, there's nothing there morphologically that makes sense here. Ahead of anything that I've seen, recombinant wise. Well, let's get it, let's get it into the lab and study it. Uh, we'll see what we can come up with. Dr. Lee, do you agree that uh, height and security is in order? Well, definitely. Yeah, after also, what you said. We, we appear to have been pursued on our way here. Uh, are you... That's uh, what Richard said. Do we have, do we have uh, adequate video surveillance here? Do we have any sort of armed personnel available? There is video surveillance. We've got, a, we've got a couple of security guards for the evenings after we've all left the lab. But yeah. uh, we can definitely step that up, yeah, if we need to. Yeah, and I, I'm going to ask Richard to talk ab about that, getting, a, getting at least four people who are awake. You bet. I think, though, that we will have some scientists here re uh, around the clock trying to figure out what this yeah. Well, we as scientists is. Didn't have, didn't have uh, automatic weapons when, yeah. we, when someone attempted to uh, uh, waylay us on the highway. Yeah, that's, that's pretty scary. Yeah. Now, Gentlemen, on the on the ride over, I was thinking about something, and if he sent it via UPS from his facility to where we picked it up, they could have tracked the package. And the last package left from his office, that they knew he released something. They ran him off the road. Maybe the same people that were chasing us killed him. They tracked the package from UPS, which is a simple, you know, business you know phone call one phone call they could track it there that's how we knew they knew it was there any tr any um vehicle leaving might have been trailed but maybe they had surveillance and watched us load it in yeah maybe but i think we need to be be cautious about um making assumptions about about who it is because it might not be bio um a biozyme you know as as flores was saying um based on the note it sounded like they got these creatures from somewhere so maybe if it was not Don Biozyme, it's wherever they, they came from. Well, Somebody well, else developed these. Well, Am gentlemen, I, let's get this, this creature inside. Absolutely. Get it into the enclosure that we've created for it. Uh, let's get you guys set up. Uh, like I say, half the building is empty. If you guys want to take uh, a couple of the offices and set up your headquarters here, this is a good place to do it. Thank you. Okay. Yep, um, well, uh, Mr. Dr. Uh, Lee, what's your specialty, by the way? Uh, I want to turn over to you. Well, I, I specialize in uh, genetic uh, bacteria. Um, uh, like I say, we've been working on bacteria that, uh, 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 that fix uh, selenium and uh, oil spills. I don't know if you're familiar with that. I, I don't know exactly what your field of study is. But... Uh, yeah. You know, they have these oil slicks and they put the bacteria in the bacteria eats the oil and it, it biologically degrades instead of destroying the, the ecosystem. Right, right. It's valuable work, but it's prokaryotic, not eu eukaryotic. So we're going to be working more with the zoologists right? Uh, at this point. Well, we got a team. We need apparently to feed this thing and it needs bone meal, ground beef. That's what I was going to ask. Do we have... And larvae. You looked at you, the you right, insect larvae. So I don't know if you have any store of insect larvae on hand. Actually, I think we do. That yeah, will be helpful. So okay. let's uh, let's see what we need to, to fix up, and we'll do that. So he takes you into the lab, and uh, the creature goes one way. You guys kind of go another. He shows you the facilities. It's it's not exactly state of the art but they can bring in any kind of additional equipment you might need. Uh, he gives you an office space, uh, which at this point in the, in the game, we'll simply say you guys can set up an office here so that this is like your headquarters where you do all of your deliberation of what you're going to do. Um, you can have your assistants come over later. They can set up your, your place. Uh, and then they show, he shows you what they've set up. And they've got kind of an isolation um, uh, facility that they've, they've created. Uh, it seems to be made of the same material that the container is, uh, though there are no air holes. They have, uh, they have pumped in 
air so that they're not being breathing whatever it's it's exuding like a filtration right and so oh, that reminds me was the was the container substantially more full of green goop when we got out of the truck yeah i'd say so i'd okay. say that it, it seems to exude this sort of slime yeah okay. um uh so they put it in this in this thing and they 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 release it but it really doesn't have much more than six feet in any direction that it can go um and they are able to there are are ways that they can extract uh samples of the slime or or whatever or do analysis of the uh the the exhaust of whatever the creature is giving off uh and they can feed it and whatever um but there there's a lot of the experiments that they would like to do they don't even know which experiments they want to do yet because what is it <laughs> i mean some classification is in order if we could take some of the slime and maybe even a sample of its tissue to analyze its structure i mean i would presume that it's mostly animal but you know they've been splicing bacterium and insect together i'm just wondering at the uh, dom biozyme just what predominant uh, genomes are in this thing right he says well we'll get to work on that immediately gentlemen and you know uh it's going to take a few days to figure some of these things out yes um do we have the facilities for some for uh, gas chromatography sure all right i can get started on that okay if he sent something to us, he might have sent something to his home or to his next of kin also as a backup or maybe notes or maybe, you know, backing himself up. We'll send this here. We'll send this here. We have to see if there's a way any of his other contacts and his last residence, uh, just to check if any other pa parcels or packages have shown up there. All right. Now, I think we'll be going to his office tomorrow if they'll let us in. Yeah, I think that's key. Although I think we'll find more uh, from what's missing from his office than what's in his office at this point, if my fears are accurate. Yeah, checking, checking the office, checking with his next of kin. Um, is it, the lab has a phone, right? I'm sorry. The the lab has a phone. Oh sure, everything. I wanna yeah. I wanna call the hotel and I wanna start set my assistant uh, Hayden Fields on trying to track down what the letters GLC might mean. Okay. Have him start chewing on G L C. It was on the biker's um Right. Yeah, I, I'm sorry, I thought you said D L C. Let's just making sure we had the same G L C. G is in charge, yeah. 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 So. yeah golf okay. Lima Charlie. Okay. And he he wants to know if there's anything else he can do. Um, Aiden, Aiden does. Uh, beyond beyond that, um, I want him to uh, start um, getting preparing my equipment, like my uh, microbiology, like culture, like bacteria culturing equipment and whatnot, and start bringing that over. Okay, he'll bring your equipment over. You give him the address and tell him to watch out for black vans. Yep. <laughs> um. I wonder if we're going to be spending our time split between these labs and the hotel, if we should get a small fleet of rental vehicles. Uh, how, 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 do, how should that work? Like, I don't want to be stuck in the back of a moving van. Yeah. I was thinking I'd just like to have a different vehicle to cruise around in. Cause you know, I don't want to be cruising around in a white van since they've already. Uh, well, Richard, popular. Richard's still there here. Richard's like, okay, well, I'll tell you what, I can commission something for you. Uh, you know, I sure, I'm sure that's, that's perfectly fine. Yeah. Um, there's a, uh, there's a lot of, yeah. Uh, maybe we should get you a couple of, a couple of uh, SUVs. Do they have SUVs in 1991? I'm sure they did. Just barely. Yeah. 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 We'll give you a couple of, of company SUVs. Ford uh, Broncos. Okay. <laughs> Ford Broncos. If yeah. that's what you want. I can, I can bring those over. Um, I'd like a white one, please. Yeah. <laughs> Ew. Uh, we're going to get you anything but white. Uh, so he says that's not a problem. I'll have those uh, 
uh, how the, I'll have them sent over here. Yeah, yeah. Um, I'm going to uh, ask my assistant, Michael, to uh, just do sort of a library background check on both Zinvatech and Don Biozyme, because I don't really know either firm. And I'd like to get some dates and names and backgrounds on that from him. Uh, okay. And I'd like to spend some time sketching the horrible thing. Okay. Because it doesn't, it, again, morphologically, it doesn't make any sense at all. Right. Long tentacles, short tentacles, two where's its eyes. It responds to movement, so it's seeing something. Maybe play a little bit with the laser pointer. Yeah, that's what I was thinking. I wanted to run some basic tests on it just to see its um, its movement. And once they feed it, I need to observe it. And feeding maybe maybe responds to. I mean, what other senses does it have? I mean, it responds to movement, but does it like eat cold? I'm sure Dr. Carlisle, you. Yeah, that's far that's... more apt to design a battery of tests as far as its behavior and, and senses far anywhere than I could. So. Okay. Well, at this point, let's say it's about 3 p.m. Um, all, of, all of this excitement has taken place over the course of a couple of hours since, you, since your meeting started with Jadig. Um, the first course of action for you as scientists is to figure out which tests and things that you want to run on this and to discuss it with the other scientists. And there's, there's quite a few. Uh, there's, there's maybe 30 other people working here who could be called scientists. Uh, and like I say, most of them are involved with the bacteriological sort of aspect of what they're doing. However, they're competent. And, uh, and a lot of these tests are going to take, like I say, the planning phase is going to take hours. And then the setup is going to take possibly a day before they can really get doing some of this stuff. Um, so we'll say by six o'clock, you guys have sort of a plan of action for tests that you'd like worked on, but now it's six o'clock and, uh, they've also beefed up security. They managed to get at least five, four more security people in here to patrol and, and they're going to be here 24 hours to make sure that nobody breaks in or anything like that. Now, are they armed guards, armed security? Yes. Okay, it's not just like some $10 no. an hour security guard. Okay. Right. No, they've, they've gotten uh, pro professional security. Don by I mean, uh, Don by I'm, uh Full Wilderness has paid for, for anything like that. Now, alternatively, if you guys wanted to do anything other than set up your lab, uh, it's, well, that, let's just say it's 6 o'clock. I think that's that's reasonable. What would you guys like to do now? You uh, guys have your cars. You have two, uh, whatever kind of cars you wanted. SUVs, Ford Broncos. I I didn't get the the OJ reference at first, but <laughs> no, I didn't. Can we call over to the hotel and have our assistants begin to come over to set up? The workstations, or let's say you already did that. Okay, okay. You, had, you had them come over a couple of hours ago, and uh, and they they've got things set up. And now it's it's kind of either that you know it's the end of the day. Uh, all of the people at the labs, of course, have been working all day already, mm -hmm. so yeah. they're they're ready to go home. Uh, security staff is here to to watch everything. Doctor Leem, is there a uh, restaurant in the neighborhood you recommend? Oh, there's, there's quite a few of them. There's some very nice ones. There's, uh, uh, what sort of food are you looking for? Italian, Chinese. Uh, there's a new, uh, there's a new Asian place. Uh, oh, that's not open yet. Uh, that's going to be opening soon though. Uh, there's, uh, there's a lot of Italian places. There's a lot of, uh, California sort of bistro places. There's a, there's a nice little place that's not too near. That's kind of near the beach. Has a nice view of the beach. Lots of gonna, places. That sounds pretty good. I'd like to, you know, I think we all have had very busy and dense days in the last 24 hours or so. It would be nice to sit down and have a glass of wine and talk about what the hell we think is going on here. Okay. Yeah. 
I was gonna say I can only speak for myself, but I think we could all use a stiff drink at this point. Oh yeah. <laughs> well, you got the places at the Crocker itself, too. Yeah. Um, right. I mean, we're close to our beds. Right. Um, I what can else just is start in the, the Bridge Fort building. The Bridgestone building. The Bridgestone building. What other off there? other offices, other other businesses, and you know whatever you can imagine. All right. I want to um, look over. Sorry, a map, real quick, and I want to just go over um, with with the team, get everybody together, and like start planning alternate routes because these people knew or kind of right where to come for us. Um, just other ways to get back and forth between the lab and. Yeah, we can probably get a couple of these maps at a gas station on our way back if we're going to the Crocker. Uh, unless there's someplace else you guys want to eat. No, hey, it doesn't be, matter. That'll be fine. That'll be fine. Yeah. Okay. You got a bar there, I'm sure. Uh, I kind of envision the five of you sitting at one table and the five assistants sitting at the other table. Yeah. Like the big boys' table and the, <laughs> the other. Oh, God. <laughs> That's exactly right. And we have small side bets on who's going to have an affair with whom <laughs> among the assistants. Um, Desmond, uh, before you arrive, uh, uh, Michael uh, hands you a, a piece of paper printout. And he says, uh, uh, this is uh, all the information I found so far on uh, Don Biazine. Well, that's quick work. Thank you. How would, how, we're looking at uh, AHA. He says it's kind of boring. This is the whole thing right now? That's, that's about it that I could find. Don Biozyme is a publicly held corporation. Any accountant, lawyer, broker, or financial advisor can get a listing for it in a few moments. Lawson Pharmaceuticals owns 60%. James Corazzini owns 13%. And about 3,000 other shareholders own the rest. Larson holds the majority of vote on the board of directors, with one share worth $23 on the day the investigators look it up, and two million shares outstanding. Don Biozyme is worth about $46 million in 1991. Founded by James Corzini, the minority holder, yeah, in 1985. The firm employs 150 people, and while conducting research in various fields of the industry, DBZ focuses most of its resources on the somewhat controversial area of genetically engineered agricultural agents. After several financial crises, Corazini gained firm backing from Larson Pharmaceuticals, a subsidiary of New World Industries. As one would expect, Larson takes special interest in Don Biozyme's personnel and research directions. Lawson Pharmaceuticals is also publicly owned, 51% by New World Industries, and the rest snapped up by various pension funds. Larson has a remarkable record of steady growth and large dividends, with results always exceeding expectations. Larson is currently worth about $2.1 billion. New World Industries is a privately held corporation chartered in the Commonwealth of the Bahamas. Little published information about it exists, but an article in Barron's deduces in passing that its total assets must be in excess of $6 billion in the NATO countries. Major holdings are inferred in Taiwan, Brazil, Paraguay, South Africa, and Iraq. Thalassa Chandler on the NWI Board of Directors is reputedly one of the wealthiest women in the world. NWI traces its roots back to the once immensely successful New World Incorporated, a mega corporation that collapsed in 1929, the result of the crash and of the death of its charismatic chairman, Edward Chandler. Though barely surviving the 1930s, WWII, World War II, left the surviving fragments flush with easy money and open international markets, enabling great diversification. In the early 1950s, the corporation bought up outstanding public shares and reorganized privately as NWI Inc. After profiting, thereafter profiting greatly from investments in business machines and information processing. A Bahamian charter was granted in the late 1970s, the event marking the end of public knowledge concerning the company. So Don Biozyme is deeply shady and very powerful. 
with that kind of money, you could buy a lot of um, motorcycles and black vans. Yeah. Apparently at least two. <laughs> and a couple of Uzis. Hmm. So you guys are sitting around having a very excellent dinner. Um, California cuisine. Um, once again, you guys have a card, uh, $350, $350 per diem, uh, which buys you all a very fine dinner. Yeah. Yeah, if I didn't trust Jadix so implicitly, I'd be suspicious of how much money we're all worth. On the other hand, we've also seen a creature that nobody else has ever seen as far as we know. Which is a big secret to keep. Well, and you all know a lot of the background of, of uh, Jadik. Right. You know, yeah. How he cured himself of cancer and uh, sort of had a spiritual awakening while he was uh, herding sheep out in the mountains <laughs> and <laughs> came back and wanted to save the planet and put all of his vast fortune into that. <laughs> And his vast knowledge of how to market things and solicit money from uh, from companies, from, from people. Right. Successful books and movies. Mm -hmm. After the shepherding phase, he was, uh, he was living as a hunter-gatherer, but mm -hmm. I don't think I know where that happened. Did he have to go to Kalahari or something? I don't know where you could do that. I don't know. Uh, he had, a, he had done the sheep herding in the Cocoa Mountains. Mm -hmm. um, I thought it was implied that he did the hunting, hunter gathering around that area. In the same area. Awesome. Yeah, I guess it's, it wasn't specified. It probably was the same general area. So what are your plans of action? You guys are all here to discuss with one another what you think you need to do. Uh, it's almost at the end of the of the evening, so we can. Yeah, I was definitely wanting to uh, once uh, run some tests on that slime that was in the container. See if we can figure let's get that figured out. Yeah. Think about sending Jack to go by the police and talk to them. You know, suddenly go, hey, you know, he's new in town. He's just wanting to. Hey, are there any criminal elements in the city that we should watch out for? Mainly looking, hey, you know, is there known gangs going by the initial GLC? I wouldn't recommend discussing what happened with us there because low-level people can be bought off. But I could, I would definitely look up the GLC. Yeah, yeah I have, I have Hayden working on on that at the moment. I'm sure he would love to accompany Jack to go talk to the police tomorrow. Yeah. I, I can't wait to see this thing feed. I, I want to watch it and track its movements. Like, is it a vicious killer? Is it, does it strangle? Does it just bite? Well, like, it's... I want to, you know, we'll first try it with, you know, chopped meat and larva, but at some point we're going to have to put a, uh, a live mouse or a rat in the container with it. No, and I would almost argue for something living sooner rather than later, to be honest. Well, I think we should probably follow the feeding protocol we're given, since at least effectively he could sedate the creature, which means he knows something more about it than we do, which is nothing. Correct, correct. I would also true. like to, I would like to look at the, uh, the slime, chromatography, um, any saliva samples. Or Every tissue we could get out of that thing. Any, any tissue, because yeah. not only do we want to learn what it's out of, but, you know, as you know, there's like, many microorganisms that live in us some have a beneficial relationship some are neutral some are parasitic um i just want to see what kind of balance of um bacteria are living in it i'm worried about pathogens um especially yeah, carrier yeah especially if uh our poor thumbless <laughs> thumbless zoologist got uh infected with anything yeah, maybe now that you bring that up, maybe you should get run some tests on her and get the report sent over, see if she has she's carrying anything. You're right, absolutely right. Well, she can, she can definitely. Uh, well, 
I can contact her and see if she'll pull her medical records from her from that visit. And we need to look at, again, Kate's office, if we can get in, see what uh, Don Biazine will show us of their own laboratory set up. Kate Fast of Ken, too. You have a tour of Don Biozyme, uh set for next Monday. It's Wednesday? Wednesday. it's Wednesday right now. All right. So they're going to be able to clean that place up real good before we get there. You read my mind, Dr. Well, and, and Tate's been missing for at least three days. All right. I think maybe we should go and contact his next of kin, see if and it's a lead. Maybe there's something we could learn. Right. Yeah. Somebody with a good bedside manner. I'm not always the most uh, tactful with strangers. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Me neither. Um, yeah. I'm going to. Do they have back newspapers here at the hotel? Sure. Yeah. I'll go uh, find one that would have been the day after. Uh, Tate went missing. See if there's an article on that, and see the uh, if there's anything more in that. Because all uh, Mr. Jatek said was that, hey, the police said it was a suicide just because his car was ab abandoned. You know, okay. and that that's what led me to say to you, Heather, not to mention anything at the police station. If they're ruling that out as a suicide already, which I mean, is there a note? Is there any other evidence? Means leads me to believe that there might be corruption down the chain there. Right. Yeah. Martinez, the the detective over the case, might want to yeah, be wary of of him. Yeah, definitely talk to uh, Martinez. Yeah, and what Michael has told me suggests that there's just an enormous amount of money involved all over the place, so we can't uh, be overly credulous. I don't want to be paranoid either, but no, no. Well, I don't. Have... I... It I mean, seems like a strong coincidence that he said, "I'm afraid of what's going to happen to me," and then he vanished. So right, I mean, and then then we're with this thing, and people uh, accost us. Well, you say we can't be paranoid, but as you've all seen with your own two eyes, we're dealing with something nobody but maybe us and the other few scientists have ever seen. I think paranoia might be one of our best friends right now. That and a good Merlot. Okay. <laughs> here, here. <laughs> I prefer a martini, but to each their own. <laughs> All right. Is that where we would like to stop for the evening? That sounds like it's a good spot. It's so, like a natural chapter. Our players included David Gassaway, Morgan Llewellyn, Brian Daly, Keith Craig, and Jason Melnichok, with myself as the Keeper of the Secrets. We're currently producing up to five shows a week with music and sound effects added to post-production in order to create a richer listener experience. We provide audio-only versions of our shows free for you to download from Podbean or iTunes. The costs involved with the shows are predominantly uh, supplied by our patrons. Without them, we couldn't be able to do any of this stuff. Uh, we have a new patron, by the way, John Lowe, who is contributing $3 a month. Thank you so much, John. If you'd like to support our show, please visit our Patreon account. Just a dollar or two a month helps us a lot. You can find a link in the description below. Like, share, and subscribe to our channel for updates on our latest shows, and leave us some comments. We enjoy reading them and answering any questions you might have. This is Tom Raley, together with all the members of our gaming club, inviting you to journey with us once again into the darkness for another adventure into the universe of HP Lovecraft, Call of the Google playing game. Until next time, good luck. <laughs>